once upon a time, in a country very, very far away, I was working as an indie video game developer, and I woke up one morning, and I was like, man, it's cold in here. Maybe if I had a real job, I could afford paying for kitty. So, uh, so I did that. I went to San Francisco to work for a startup called GitHub. That was like three years ago, and we were like 12 people, so it didn't count as a real job either. But uh, now we are like at 150, and we are doing pretty well, so I guess it came out all right. This story is not about GitHub, though. This is a scary story about Ruby internals. Hi, my name is Vizan Marti. I go as VMG on most places on the internet, so just GitHub and Twitter. And I work on the GitHub systems team. Um, what the systems team does is basically, you know that uh, GitHub has one of the largest Ruby deployments in probably the world. It's massive. And we are in charge of making sure that Ruby is more or less behaving as it should. It's a pretty cool job. I really enjoy it. Uh, this talk is about a few of the horror stories that we've found over the years while trying to deploy Ruby massively around a lot of servers and writing, you know, massive Rails apps running on Ruby. My plan was to share with you four stories that I picked, but then I found out I only have half an hour, so it's going to be two stories. And then I found out that Konstantin already spoke about my two stories in his keynote, so thank you, Konstantin. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so to make this easy, I guess I'm going to tell the stories as if they were fairy tales. I don't know why. I guess it's because I have a lot of spare time. I get bored a lot. So <laughs> off we go. Chapter one, Mark and Sweep, the dumb tale of a dumb garbage collector. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, legend says that there exists this mythical creature inside of MRI called Mark and Sweep. Very little is known about this creature because most of the tales ever written about it are written in an old, long-lost language with arcane symbols. Uh, Japanese, yeah, Japanese. The dogs are in Japanese. So um, this creature is more like two creatures. You see, it's uh, two heads in a single body. This head on the left goes by the name of Mark, and the head on the right goes by the name of Sweep. Together, they make the Ruby Garbage Collector. Um, this Ruby Garbage Collector, the legend says that it's pretty straightforward. That means simple. And when it comes to garbage collectors, that means bad. So it's conservative, which means that it doesn't really know what it's doing. Non-deterministic, <laughs> which means that it doesn't know when it's going to do it. <laughs> it's a stop the war garbage collector, which means it's terrible. And it's mark and sweep, as the name implies. Basically a shit show, really. <laughs> It's bad, trust me. Let's start with the left head, shall we? His name is Mark. He has a very simple task. He walks the object graph looking for things that look like Ruby objects. That's the point of it. It needs to find all the roots of the object space to find the objects that are being currently used by Ruby to prevent those objects from being freed. Now, this is pretty straightforward because it can start you know, from global variables, or you can start from. Uh, uh, the functions in your current scope, and it starts marking those and finding uh, the other objects that those objects uh, uh, relate to. But this gets nasty very, very easily because Ruby handles row pointers to six extensions. When the, what this means is that Mark, which is not a very smart guy, by the way, he has to walk all the way through the uh, C stack. That means it's not going through some kind of virtualized stack like other VMs has. It actually has to go through a row like a, x8664 stack and walk down all the way through it, trying to find pointers to things that look like Ruby objects. So in practice, what this looks like is something like, oh, this kind of looks like a pointer, I guess. Can we free this? Oh, you can try. Uh, wait, well, it's not, not like that, but I mean, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, not sure that the Ruby garbage collector has a very deep and comical voice, but it could have it very well. So. So after Mark is done doing his job, his uh, counterpart, Sweep, gets into action. Sweep has an even easier task. It goes through every single object in the object space. The, those are very easy to find because they are all in the Ruby heap, right? And it frees the ones that have not been touched by Mark. If they have not been touched, it means that they are not being used, so they can be freed. So far, so easy, except it's completely broken. Uh, the problem here 
is that there is memory allocated by Ruby that the Ruby garbage collector cannot really detect. Let's give a simple example. We have this Ruby function uh, in C land that takes a value. The value is a pointer to a Ruby object. Now, this value we know is a string, so we can actually dereference the value, an internal pointer in the value, to access the actual contents of the string. Looks something like this. You see, uh, there is the actual Ruby object, which is the value pointer, that Mark can tell it's a Ruby object. And then there is this block of memory allocated by the garbage collector that it's pointed at by uh, the object itself. It's inside the object. And when you do the R stream PTR the reference, you just get the pointer to that internal block of memory. Let's play it forward. The issue happens now when we try to call a function, we try to do operations with that internal string pointer that is not the Ruby object itself. You see, um, when we call the do something function and we pass the actual internal pointer, uh, the garbage collector does a very, very risky assumption. We're just saying that uh, the stack is going to look like this. This is not the case because, as you can see, when we call the do something function, we no longer use the actual Ruby object RB4 anywhere. So the compiler has no reason to keep that object on the stack. It can very easily kick the object out of the stack. And when we are inside of the do something uh, function, the stack would look just like this, right? The Ruby object would be gone from the stack, but we would still have access to that internal pointer that was inside of the Ruby object. So here's the issue. When we do stuff in that function, we could very well call a Ruby a C function, you know, any of the functions in the RB underscore namespace. And most of those functions have a chance of triggering a garbage collector run, which means that Mark and Sweep get into action, and Mark goes like, oh, well, go through the stack. Yeah, let's go see if it's through the stack. And things get very nasty now, because when Mark starts going to the stack, the only thing he finds is that internal pointer and he's like, this doesn't look like a Ruby object. No touchy. No touchy. And after the mark run is over, what happens is that Trip comes into action and finds all the Ruby objects in the, in the object heap. Now, what we have here is that there is this string object in the Ruby heap that is pointing to the internal memory we are using. But it's not being marked because we don't have a pointer to the actual Ruby object. We have a pointer to the, its internal memory. So there is no root. So object with no roots, set on fire. <laughs> set on fire. <laughs> That's bad. That's bad because once we are done doing stuff, we, we can still access a, the STR pointer in our code, but that STR pointer has been set on fire. <laughs> now, I'm not an expert on this. I don't know what a sec fall sounds like inside of a computer, but I imagine it sounds like an explosion, like boom. It's like, what was that? I don't know. I think you broke something. <laughs> no, I didn't. The big issue here is that this is bad. You, know, you may think it's funny. It's bad. It's, it's terrible. It's <laughs> a terrible thing. You may think it doesn't affect you. Trust me, it does. It, this is the famous bundler bug. You know, when you do a bundle run, it check falls on the Zedri Z library. It's exactly this thing. And it affects any uh, Ruby stack that is running C code inside of it. So basically all of it. And how do we work around it? Does this uh, terrible fairy tale have a happy ending? Uh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, I'm not a native speaker, so. Um, uh, a <laughs> lot of people say that the easiest way to work around this is. <laughs> the easiest way to work around this is building your native extensions with O2 on their GCC to prevent the GCC optimizer from dropping those pointers from the stack. In practice, this doesn't work that well. In fact, it works pretty poorly because uh, GCC has several optimization phases, and there are a lot of those phases that run on the O2 uh, level that can drop those pointers from the stack. In practice, even if you build your extensions with O2, you're going to have a bad time because those uh, pointers on the stack are going to get kicked out anyway. So how do we work around this? Well, there are several happy endings in this story, actually. The first one, which is my favorite, which is drink yourself to sleep every night. <laughs> this works very well, trust me. There is this magical thing, it's called booze. You drink that, and you get this state called uh, pass out. And the legend says that if production goes down and you are unconscious, nobody can really blame you, right? <laughs> so. 
Trust me, it works very well. I've tested this very, very often. There is another option, which is stressing the garbage collector in critical paths. This also works very well in production. How does this work? Well, uh, it's only two pieces of code, two small snippets. First, on C land, we change our memory allocator to use a perturbation mode. What this means is that every time you allocate or free memory, you're exactly going to tamper with it to fill it with trash. This trash is going to uh, make sure that if we try to access the uh, free pointer by the garbage collector, this is going to set fault to make sure that we are not accid accidentally accessing a pointer that has been freed, but is still on the heap. And the other part is in RubyLand, enable a GC stress mode on the garbage collector. This, what this forces is that every time you call a Ruby function that can trigger a garbage collection, it always triggers. So there is a very effective way. It basically consists on uh, running your test suit and watching if it catches fire. It's, it's exciting. You say, oh, it burns. So you change the code until it stops burning. Uh, for extra points, you can use Valgrind or uh, Asan instead of tampering on the memory allocator uh, to get very, very, very uh, accurate uh, reports of when memory that is being freed is actually being used. This is very reliable, but at the same time, it's also very slow because garbage collection stress mode is very slow. It, it triggers a lot of garbage collection fastest. Uh, and Valgrind makes the whole room interpreter well, even slower. So if you are actually uh, uh, running a rest of what you're going you're gonna have a bad time with this. <laughs> and the last point is static analysis. You can actually uh, try to analyze your native C extensions and see if this kind of uh, pathological case where the pointer gets thrown of the stack is actually happening in the, in the assembly code. This is very tricky to do. After to do it, it's a pain in the ass. Especially because GCC is, is a complete clusterfuck when it comes to static analysis. And you can use uh, LLVM, which has very nice tooling for static analysis, but makes no sense because in production, you're probably going to build your, uh, your native extensions with GCC, and you do, it, the two compilers don't really have the same uh, optimization phases. So the static analysis doesn't, doesn't apply between the two compilers. So the best option is by far the second one, stressing the garbage collection path. And if you're running critical code in production, it's a very worthy thing to do. That was the first time, the first tale, sorry. The uh, second tale is called Our Time is Running Out, and it's about timeouts. You see, when I started uh, in GitHub, I had never written Ruby before, and I asked one of my coworkers, uh, how, do you, how, do, how do you feel about timeouts? He's like, there are no timeouts in Ruby. I was like, are you sure about that? Have you checked? They, like, there has to be a way to timeout code in Ruby. Like, if you got a long running network call, it has to be a way to actually time that out. He like, no, just ask the timeout rabbit. Like, how do, how do I do that? Like, well, it's just, just summon the timeout rabbit. I did that, just did require timeout, and then I had this small piece of code that it was supposed to timeout in five seconds. So I did that. I run the piece of code and waited and waited and waited. And after 60 seconds later, my code finished ex executing, and the timeout rabbit showed up. He was like, Oh, hey, sorry I couldn't come here. Uh, sorry I couldn't get here any faster. Uh, so I was like, time out, Rabbit, what's wrong with you? Why did you take so long to show up here? <laughs> what's going on? So the time out, Rabbit explained this to me. Uh, he said, this is how a timeout in Ruby is actually implemented. It's actually very, very illegal. Check this out. It basically just spawns a new thread and puts that thread to sleep. When the thread wakes up, it just raises the timeout rabbit, and the timeout rabbit shows up in your main thread. And it's like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> when the rabbit told me that, I said, that's beautiful. But the rabbit said, yeah, it's also wrong. <laughs> the issue here is at least in MRI 1.8.7, and don't tell me it's deprecated because I still use it in production, so. <laughs> so I don't care, so. The threads and the interpreter are actually implemented as green threads, which means that they are not synchronized by the kernel. They are actually synchronized by the interpreter. So when you have that uh, timeout thread that's just sleeping and waiting to, to wake up and raise the timeout ex exception, if your mind thread, the one that is running the long computation that needs to be timed out, goes into the kernel, like does a syscall, a blocking syscall that's going to take a long while to return, basically every single other green thread becomes locked because the kernel has no idea that the Ruby interpreter has threads inside of it. 
these are green threads, so the kernel only sees a single Ruby process. And when that syscall happens from the Ruby process, the kernel just puts the whole process to sleep until the syscall has finished. So when the syscall has finally finished, then is when the process wakes up, and then like two minutes have passed, and your timeout is like two minutes late. <laughs> you can say, but this has been fixed in MRI 1.9.3 because it has native threads. Uh, Kind of. I mean, with native threads, indeed, uh, the kernel actually sees every single thread and can schedule them properly. But the point of the, uh, the issue here is that 1.9.3 has a global interpreter lock, uh, GBL, we call that. And in order to raise the timeout exception, you need to own the GBL. So if you are doing that uh, long-running computation and you go into, into a syscall, you go into in, if the kernel just sleeps that thread, the timeout thread cannot really raise because it can be scheduled by the, by the kernel scheduler, but when it gets scheduled, uh, it cannot really raise anything because it doesn't own the GVL. So it's like, ah, ah, don't move. So it's bad. It's very bad. Um, so how do, you, how do we work around this? I was, I, was, I was clueless. I had no idea how to do this. But one night, I fell asleep and I had a dream. I saw a ghost in a swamp of an old man. <laughs> And he told me, use the force, kid. And I was like, Mr. Mr. Richie, what, 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 what do you mean? What is the force? And I said, and she, she said, Unix, you moron. Unix is the force. <laughs> so when I woke up the next day, I opened my computer. And somehow, there was a man page open in my terminal, magically. <laughs> it was the man page for a uh, SIG alarm, which is a magnificent uh, uh, signal that has been around for 40 years that does just that. It signals your process that something needs to happen. For instance, so raising a time of exception. This works very well in 1.8.7. It's already been implemented in a, in a gem called um, POSIX uh, timeout. And if you are do, running 1.8.7, you're going to need to use a POSIX timeout. If you're running 1.9.3, your best bet is to make sure that when you go into, C, into, into a long-running syscall, you release the GVL before going in there. This can be very tricky, because if you actually go into GitHub and find Ruby's extensions, you'll see that 99% of them just don't give a shit. Like, they just GVL, and that was that. I'm not, I'm not going to release that. So basically, the process box forever. You either need to change the Ruby gem to make sure it's actually releasing the GVL before it does the syscall, or you can also use a fork of POSIX, uh, POSIX timeout that actually uh, works with 1.9.3. This is a pretty scary story, but here's the thing. It gets even worse, you see? During my travels, I met, I met an old man, an old friend. His name is Matthias Mann the Wise. Uh, you probably don't know this guy. Uh, he's German. He happens to work at Travis CI together with Constantine and another couple of guys with poor tastes when it comes to facial hair. But I really love these people. And, and Matthias Mann, the wise, is the head infrastructure honcho of Travis. He's a great guy. Also, he has a, a book called The React Handbook, which is fucking amazing. And if you are building distributed systems with React, you should buy this book because it's a good one. I'm not getting paid for this, by the way. It's actually a good book. So <laughs> it's seriously a good book. You, you will enjoy it. Um, so this old man, we were chatting, and he told me this terrible, uh, terrible story. He said, I, too, had a dreadful problem with timeouts, you see. You see, I was using JRuby in Travis CI. I interrupted the wizard. I say, so you had a problem, and you were using JRuby? Well, it sounds like you have two problems to me, right? <laughs> the wizard say, shut the fuck up, kid. <laughs> You see, I was using JRuby and that shitty GitHub API that you guys keep breaking. And, and we had this issue that we had a long running uh, call, API call that simply was not timing out. It was actually halting our whole production servers to, to a halt because if it weren't timing out, it means that our whole servers could do like six requests per hour to, to the API because the timeout was simply not finishing. The GitHub servers were stalling, and we were not timing out. So I was like, well, that's probably because the thread is slipping or is it stuck in the JVL. And the wizard said, you fool. JRuby has native threads and fine-grained locking. And he just smacked it with the staff. 
he then proceeded to explain when I woke up from my coma, and he told me that there is a pretty serious issue in JRuby 1.6.7, that if you have two nested timeouts in uh, your application, the longest timeout covers the short one. So this piece of do something code, it will, it's not going to timeout in five seconds. It's going to timeout in 60 seconds, and then it will timeout in five. <laughs> oh boy, JRuby. Um, but I like this bug. I like this bug. I, I, I like this bug because uh, it gives a moral to this story. You see, uh, it's a pretty bad bug. Like objectively speaking, it's pretty to the right. When it comes to ugly bugs, there's simple bugs, complex bugs, there's painful bugs. And then there's this nasty timeout bug in the JVM, right? But MRI, on the other hand, it's, it's a little bit more to the right, I think. Like, you, you keep walking and then you leave the... <laughs> You leave the realm of bugs and you keep walking through the valley of common sense. You go past that and you start, <laughs> you start climbing the mountains of reason. You keep climbing, you descend the mountains of reason. And after years and years of traveling, you finally reach the country of what the hell are you doing? And then you find MRI trying to time out shit with green threads. That's where we are at in ruin production. 2013, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so what's the moral of this story? Because all good stories have a moral, right? All, all days have a moral. For me, it's the same thing I talk about in every single talk I give when it comes to systems. Which is that sometimes worse is better. Uh, this doesn't apply to the MRI GC. This. There is no way around that. <laughs> there is no way around that, seriously. It's a lost cause. But when it comes to computers, there's a thing. Like, computers suck. They break all the time. And they, if the computer is running Ruby, it's going to break even more often. Trust me, I've been there. But one thing we've learned, I've learned, and we've learned over, over the five years of running a massive uh, Ruby installation in production, is that sometimes the simplest thing works better. MRI is broken in many, in many ways, but it has a great advantage that it's, it's broken in predictable ways. You see, if you build simpler systems, they will break in simpler ways, and they, that will make fixing them easier. So assuming that all software is going to break, which it is, when it comes to systems, I mean, if you're doing a Rails app, then it's not going to break. It's Rails. Like, it's going to have a thousand holes everywhere, but it's not going to break. But if you're actually running complex systems code, the simpler you make your systems stack, the simpler it's going to be to debug, and the simpler it's going to be to fix those crazy issues that are going to happen, whether you want it or not. So these are the two tales I chose. I hope you found this interesting. This is the end of my story. I live happily ever after with Ruby. The end. Thank you so much. Uh, so if we have time for questions. We have five minutes for questions. I will gladly answer questions regarding this talk, or the Ruby stack at GitHub, or how I managed to stay alive. Whatever, any questions regarding talk, the Ruby stack of GitHub? Any, anything you guys want to know? Yes. How big is the data center? Well, Jesse, how big is the data center? <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's a very complex stack. We have right now, it's how many front ends? Like 12 front ends right now? 13 frontends, and we have the same number of file servers behind them. Damn, we're big. Uh, yeah, of course, we have 30 file servers and 30 failovers for each file server, which is where we store the actual Git repos. It gets big very fast. Uh, that's only for the main, of course, that's only for the main github.com app. Then you've got to consider uh, talks. Oh, sorry. You've got to consider a speaker deck. You've got to consider... Uh, Gouges. We, re we run a lot of inter internal and external Ruby apps that are not github.com. And every single one of those apps is its own, its own Ruby stack on its own. So it gets big very, very fast. More questions? Yes. Uh, so are you talking about a pink unicorn? Are you talking about... Uh, 
Uh, so re re ripple of line is mainly either the uh, file server is overloaded or we just uh, lost this, the routing layer, which we call smoke. We have this routing layer, which is called smoke, that basically every time we have to perform a git operation. I have a talk on this. It's a very good talk. You should watch it. It's, on, it's online. Um, <laughs> it's also coming to Bacon in London. You should come see me. Every time you perform a git operation, we have this routing layer that queries Redis for the actual file server and path where your repo is stored. So sometimes if the load is too high, then that, that lookup on smoke fails, and you get the repo offline error. But it comes back usually very, very quickly. You can totally race. Like if you hit it when we are performing the the, the move, it's gonna race. It's gonna it's gonna fail. Usually it gets banned very well, but there are those crazy ass repos that talk in things like Android repos, high energy mode, those talk like four or five uh, DX repos that we try to keep high energy and they don't go crazy. Got it? All right, thank you again, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you.